Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So we're very happy today to have Matthias Ludwig from the University of Regensburg in Germany, who is going to tell us about the spinner bundle on loop space and its fusion product. Matthias, please. Thank you for the invitation. So um, as I said just before, so if you if you have any questions or want to want me to go into more detail at any any point, so just interrupt me. So this is sort of the idea is to explain this construction because I think it's it's sort of important. And as you'll see, it's not entirely by me or not even that much is by me, but uh, I, I still think it's worth to talk about it. Um, so um, maybe the story starts with, with this like paper of Witten or maybe there were things before, but I think Witten really brought this idea of the drug operator of loop space into the mathematical community, um, which is sort of the elephant in the room that <laughs> everybody wants to get to, but like sort of can't really. Um, and then a lot of people talked about string manifolds and, you know, possibly relations to string theory, but um, also looked at the mathematical side of things a lot. Um, but really, of course, the, the thing you really need to, to do to talk about a drug operator on loop space, you should first talk about um, a spinner bundle on loop space. And so that, to my knowledge, like the first people who really did this seriously was were Stolz and Teichner. And that's another sort of funny thing because it's they, they have this draft from 2005, which has lots of miraculous theorems and wonderful ideas. But, but never got finished. And so it had, like, it didn't contain the proofs of most things, um, but it was like sort of very influential in, in this community. And so then a lot of people, I think, tried to fill all these gaps, but nobody really did it until I think, um, like Conrad Waldorf and the student, his student Peter Crystal um, sort of, finished this construction pretty much along the lines of, um, of Stolz and Teichner in like, um, like, last, like the last couple of years. Um, and so that's the, that's the theories of, of three papers um, where they like first look at the path, like the one loop story, like not one loop in, in loop expansion, but like really the story, what, what happens at a point in the loop space and then how to do a smooth spinner bundle, and then how to add this fusion product like globally. Um, and I sort of want to talk about these constructions. And um, it's also part of what, what I'm sort of really trying to, to, to get done right now is to write like a sort of an exposition of this, which, which simplifies several of the things. Um, and uh, like contain some additional work that, that, that I put into this. And so I'm gonna try to um, give you like a little presentation on this. Okay, so um, let's first start. Um, so really with uh, what is, what, what are, what are spin C structures? Um, and so, so the, the, the construction is based on Lagrangians in, in, in a real Hilbert space. No tell you all about it in a moment. But so why spin C structures um, as opposed to spin structures? Well, it sort of turns out that, that the spinner bundle on loop space is, is sort of more analogous to the spins to a spin C bundle in, in finite dimensions. And the reason is that you're trying to extend um, so so it's related to the central extension of the of the loop group of the spin group. And that's an extension by U1, uh, similar to like the extension of, of SO but to, to spin C. Whereas like the, the extension of, of SO to by spin is just a Z2 extension. So that's sort of a different thing because like fibers are discrete. And so that's why sort of spin C structures are, are, are the more analogous thing to look at here. And so what's, what's, a, what's, what's a definition for a spin C structure? And this is one possible one. And that's sort of the one that we're gonna be using. Namely, so if M is a manifold and we have a bundle of, of finite dimensional 
real Hilbert spaces, um, by which I mean complex Hilbert spaces with a real structure. Okay, so that's what the real in quotation marks means. Um, which, which is really the same thing as an ordinary real Hilbert space, which is then complexified. So you can go back and forth. But anyway, um, and so this H can be either, can be the tangent bundle of M if M is finite dimensional for now, or any other bundle as you wish. And what you can do is you can form, you can form this bundle of Clifford algebras by like um, just fiber-wise applying the Clifford algebra construction so um, maybe maybe a little reminder. So so the or also to set notation. So the Clifford relations that I use is um, so v times w plus w times v should be equal to minus two times the scalar product of v times v and w times times the identity in in the algebra. So um, and v and w are elements of H, and the Clifford algebra of H is the universal algebra generated by elements of H um, subject to, to this relation. And so in particular elements of V squared to minus, like squared to y minus one if, if they have not one. And so now the definition is that a spinner bundle for H is a bundle of irreducible graded Clifford H um, left modules. So by graded, uh, I mean always Z2 graded, so maybe I'll just write super instead of this, so it's just it's super modules. And the Clifford algebra is a super algebra graded by even an odd degree. And so, um, and, and that is a super module means that odd elements act by odd operators and even by even operators. Okay, and so, so in, in finite dimension, this, this sort of gives back the usual definition of a spin C manifold provided that H is, is um, an even dimensional one because only then, um, the Clifford algebra, I mean, so, so such an irreducible module is, is really like sort of a Morita equivalence to C. And um, so only, only in even dimensions is the Clifford algebra actually Morita equivalent to C. In other words, it's the star sum of matrix algebras. Um, okay, so, um, and we'll see what that means in a moment. Okay, let's, let's look at the pointwise story. So, so Let's fix one real vector space H naught. And so how do we get such an irreducible module? And the answer is, um, or one answer is via Lagrangians. So if you have a Lagrangian in your space, so, so what's, what's a Lagrangian here? Um, I mean, by this, I mean that um, the complement of L is equal to the complex conjugate of, of L, okay? So that's sort of not the same thing as a Lagrangian in a symplectic vector space, um, but it's sort of the, 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 like a super version of it. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by Lagrangian here. And given such a Lagrangian, um, you can get a representation on Fox space. So what you can do is you can, you can form this exterior algebra of L. Um, and Consider this as, an, as a new Hilbert space. And then you get a rep representation of the Clifford algebra on this, um, which is characterized by, the, by these two properties here. So there's a unique representation with these two properties, <clears throat> namely, so uh, real elements of V are act as skew adjoint operators. So in other, words, in other words, V bar acts as minus V star, so to speak. And if V is an element in Lagrangian, then it acts on the Fox space just by wedging, okay? And so these are these Fox, Fox representations. And so for each Lagrangian, you get such, such an irreducible super left Clifford module. And um, so the question is, how to do this globally, right? Um, so globally, you have, you have a fiber bundle of, of Lagrangians. So at each point in the manifold, you have your Hilbert space Hx. And then you take the space of Lagrangians in this Hilbert space and all these Lagrangians, they fit together to a fiber bundle on the manifold. 
And of course, the easiest way to obtain um, such a um, spinner bundle for H is by just choosing a section of this bundle. And then you can just, at each point, take the Fox space for the section. <clears throat> but, but these so sections usually don't exist, right? For example, if M is, say, a sphere, an, e an even dimensional sphere, and you take the tangent bundle, then basically a Lagrangian is the same thing as a complex structure on the sphere. And, and that's sort of, um, these exist in, if the dimensions is two or six, and otherwise they don't exist. Right, so an almost complex structure to be precise. So, um, and so like usually they don't exist, right? Or very often they don't exist. So this would be too restrictive. And instead what you do is you um, well, choose an open cover say, well, that's one way to do it. Choose an open cover um, over which this bundle has sections. So this bundle is always locally trivial. And then over these, uh, opens you get these like you get a bundle of fox spaces and now you glue these together by um by um isomorphisms so by, by module isomorphisms right so over the over the twofold twofold overlaps here you want you want an isomorphism of of Clifford modules uh, mapping this there and it, because these are irreducible, um, irreducible uh, um, modules, so then um, there's there are u one many for, for these. So so, so this the, the space of isomorphisms between these modules is a, is a complex line. And of course, for this to work, like to give you to, to glue together to a global bundle, these things need to <clears throat> satisfy a co-cycle condition, right? So if you if you start here and you go over here and then you go over here, like if you're if you're in this threefold intersection, <clears throat> then this should this should be the same thing as going with this isomorphism directly. And there's an obstruction for doing this, and that's a U1 bundle jerk. That is the obstruction, and this is the, you can call it Lagrangian jerk. And in many cases, you can say precisely what the, what this what this gerb is in terms of like other quantities or other bundle gerbs or whatever. So um, <clears throat> the upshot is it is certainly much easier to to like find a spinner bundle than a section of Lagrangians, but still, it's not always possible. And there's there's an obstruction gerb to do this. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> The this, this spinner bundle, or in other words, the spinner bundle exists if this, if this Lagrangian jerk is trivial. Um, <clears throat> okay, in the final dimensional example, um, maybe I should write this down. Um, so the example is um, if, uh, if, yeah, H is just the tangent bundle of M and M is a finite dimensional manifold, then, um, okay, so maybe I should say, uh, should be a little more precise because I didn't I didn't talk about the super before. So so this is a super bundle jerk. So the super bundle jerk is one that has um, over so so say it's given in terms of an open cover. Then over twofold intersections, it has um, a, a, a super line bundle. <clears throat> so so a line bundle that's Z two graded. And of course, for a line bundle, this means that it's uh, either even or odd on, on each connected component. And what, why is this Lagrangian jerk a super line? Well, because, because these Fox spaces are all graded vector spaces. And it turns out that, that any, any module isomorphism is either purely even or purely odd. And it can also happen that, that, these, that these Fox modules are isomorphic. But that they are that they are isomorphic through an odd linear transformation, and so then then we just say um, this 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 line of of homomorphisms between the Fock modules is is odd graded if its elements are odd operators, and so this gives a super bundle jerk, and so back to our example now. So super bundle jerks have have like two characteristic classes. Um, so first, every super bundle jerk gives 
an ordinary bundle verb by, by, by forgetting the grading. And so they have a certain three class, which is this Dixmere duity class. And the Dixmere duity class <clears throat> um, of, of this uh, bundle gerb log is just um, W3 of M. So the third interval Schieffer Whitney class. This tolerant class that you get by applying the Bockstein homomorphism to the second. Um, to the second uh, Stiefel Whitney class. So that's a, a third degree class in, in integral cohomology. But then <clears throat> they also have like these super bundle gerbs have an additional characteristic class, which is a Z2 value to one class. Um, like one way to say what this is, is basically, um, I mean, over each, over each twofold intersection, you have this line bundle, and, and you can just label these twofold intersections by either plus or minus one, depending on whether the line bundle is even or odd graded. And that gives you a check co cycle, which is Z2 valued and, and gives you this, this characteristic class. And we can also say what this orientation class is that's just the first sheet of Whitney class of M, which is a one class in uh, with values in Z2. So it's like an explicit example. And so um, you see these, these two character, characteristic classes and finite dimensions are precisely the obstruction classes for a spin C structure to exist, right? So first you, W1 of M vanishing means that your manifold is oriented. So that should certainly be the case. You should first be able to reduce to SO. And then to further lift the structure group to spin C, um, for spin, it will be W2 vanishing, but spin C is a weaker condition. So it's enough that, that the image of W2 under the Bockstein vanishes. And that's this integral class. <clears throat> okay, so what, what happens now if we pass to infinite dimensions, so meaning that this bundle H is an infinite dimensional bundle, then what, what happens is that um, these Lagrangians are not always equivalent representations. And that's this uh, well-known Siegel shale criterion. Uh, and this criterion says that um, <clears throat> these, these Fox spaces are, are isomorphic as, as representations of the Clifford algebra. If and only if the difference of these, so, so these are the orthogonal projections onto, onto the Lagrangians in H and, and the difference um, needs to be Hilbert Schmidt. So these, these subspaces need to be closed together in, in this sense. And then we say, in this case, we say that L1 and L2 are Siegel equivalent or just equivalent. Okay. And maybe explicitly saying what this means is so what, what, what it means to be equivalent um, uh, is that um, there exists a unitary transformation from between the Fox spaces. That, that sort of intertwines these representations. And it's enough to, 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 to have this intertwining condition on, 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 on H naught because that generates the Clifford algebra. So, um, and, and, and so this unitary exists if and only if L1 and L2 are, um, <clears throat> are equivalent. Um, and so what happens is if, if we wanna, if we wanna like apply this recipe here, where we, where we say, okay, over each um, over each open, we choose like the section of this Lagrangian bundle, and then we have to glue them together. <clears throat> we need we what we need to know is that um, the, these Lagrangian sections over twofold inter interlaps uh, or overlaps are always equivalent, right? So they, they need to always be like Siegel equivalent in order to to for the Fox spaces to give isomorphic representations and to be able to glue them at all. Otherwise, there are no non-trivial intertwiners between the two. And, <clears throat> um, but another thing that happens is, is the following, namely, um, if what, what you can do is if, if you have two, two equivalent Lagrangians, then um, the Fox spaces, I mean, any representation of the Clifford algebra in, in star representation into, in, induces a topology by just sort of pullback of the, of the weak topology or ultra weak topology on bounded operators. And um, so any two Lagrangians um, defined topology, like in this way, you take an 
an ultra weakly open subset of, of the bounded operators on the Fox space and just take their pre image under 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 their representation that gives you a topology, an algebra topology. Well, not an algebra topology because, well, ultra weak topology has certain issues, but it gives you a topology on the Clifford algebra. And now, if these two, um, uh, if you have two equivalent Lagrangians, then then this relation just tells you that the, the two topologies um, induced on the Clifford algebra by these Lagrangians are actually the same. Because, because like um, the ultra weak topology is in, in, invariant under, under conjugation by unitary transformations. And so um, <clears throat> what you can do now is we get a canonical completion of, of our Clifford algebra of our space with respect to some equivalence class of Lagrangians. So, so let's say we have an equivalence class of Lagrangians that we are, they were fixed under this equivalence relation above. So these are all Lagrangians that are closed in the Silbert-Schmidt sense. Then, then we get a canonical completion of this Clifford algebra to two of phenomenon algebras, C0. And, and this, this, this phenomenon algebra has the property that it's canonically isomorphic to bounded operators on Fox space <clears throat> For, for like on, on FL for any Lagrangian in our fixed equivalence class. And so, so maybe to be, be a little more explicit. So either, I mean, I said these topologies coincide and they're all vector space topologies on the same vector space. So you can just take the abstract completion and then they, <clears throat> then you have this, then, then you can, uh, um, yeah, extend this, this representation by continuity or you can write it like the C naught sort of as a co-limit over all these, these bounded operators. So it's like, but you get this canonical thing that, that acts on every Fox space in natural way. So you don't have to like choose a Lagrangian or whatever. It's this canonical algebra that's just there. <clears throat> on the other hand, it really depends on the choice of this equivalence class of Lagrangians. And if you choose another equivalence class, then you get another phenomenon algebra I mean, of course, it's going to be isomorphic because it's a type one factor, but it's not going to be isomorphic with an isomorphism, for isomorphism fixing the algebraic Clifford algebra inside it. Okay, so that's the point. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so that's sort of this thing that we have, which I want you to keep in mind. But so um, to, to, to do this box space construction globally, we need um, H to be a polarized on all Hilbert spaces. So in each fiber, um, we need um, an, a chosen equivalence class of Lagrangians. So um, you can say this in various, in, in two things, in two, two, like two ways. So, um, so, so sort of you want a locally trivial fiber bundle over M, which, which, which has a typical fiber, this, this equivalence class of Lagrangians that you fixed. Or also, if you have the Silbert space bundle, the typical uh, structure group would, would be O of H naught, which is a contractible group. Um, but really what you want is sort of, sort of you want a restructure, reduction of the structure group to this restricted orthogonal group. Which is, which is the group where of, of all transformations that, that fix this given equivalence class of Lagrangians. So that, that I mean, any orthogonal tra transformation takes a Lagrangian to another Lagrangian, but um, what, you, what we want is if we take a Lagrangian in our equivalence class, then, then GL should again be a Lagrangian in the same equivalence class. And so, so we assume, what we need to assume or we need to have is that this, this Hilbert space bundle as the structure group reduced to this restricted orthogonal group, which is very non-contractible and has lots of interesting mm -hmm. topology. And so then we get a bundle of phenomenon algebras um, by completing this, this Clifford algebra, algebraic Clifford algebra bundle with respect to like the fiberized Lagrangians and, and yeah, one can, now, I mean, think about what, what is the correct notion of bundle of Neumann algebras. Of course, it's going to be only a continuous bundle. In this case, it's very easy because it's a bundle of type one factors. And then, um, yeah, you get sort of, you get this bundle, but again, it depends on this choice of polarization of your bundle. Okay, um, 
So, and that's sort of the definition that that I want to say. So, so definition for a spinner bundle for um, a bundle of uh, so of real polarized Hilbert spaces H. So, so this was sort of the definition that we had above, just a little bit corrected. So we above we assumed that that, that our bundle was finite dimensional. In that case, of course, all Lagrangians are equivalent. Um, and in the infinite dimensional case, you need to substitute finite dimensional by polarized bundle. And <clears throat> so what you what you want then is that the spinner bundle is at each fiber isomorphic to a Fox space with 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 um, or a Lagrange in your equivalence class, and that's sort of ensured by saying that we don't want uh, a bundle of Clifford H modules, so modules for the algebraic Clifford algebra on this infinite dimensional Hilbert space, but uh, the bundle of C modules where C is this bundle of von Neumann algebras obtained by completing the Clifford algebra. And that's sort of the general definition, what is a spinner bundle for like in this, in this infinite dimensional setting. Um, So I'm going to apply this to the loop space now. Are there any any questions or comments so far on this? So basically, I just explained how to generalize um, the, the, the notion of a spinner bundle for a vector bundle from finite dimension to infinite dimensional settings. And the point was really that we need this additional structure of a polarization on our Hilbert space bundle. Otherwise, like this doesn't this, this doesn't really make sense. <clears throat> and so, really, the question is, um, where do we get this polarization from, right? So, um, we want to apply this to the loop space, which is this infinite dimensional manifold of of smooth maps from S one to X, where X is an oriented Riemannian manifold. So oriented is sort of necessary for a few things later on. And um, what we want to apply our construction to is this bundle of Hilbert spaces with, with fibers H gamma. So gamma is a, always my notation for, for a loop. And um, so the fibers are the Hilbert space uh, completion of the tangent space, basically, and that's the, the space of square integrable vector fields along along my along a given loop. Um, so it's, we, we complexify to get a real Hilbert space with real in quotation marks. Now we can look at Lagrangians inside this infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so this is actually going to be a smooth bundle of Hilbert spaces because um, because um, I mean, what you what you can write this as is that that like so H um, is um, so you can look at the looped frame bundle and just take the associated bundle with like the, the know, model Hubert space where H naught is just L two of S one with C D, um, and so <clears throat> this is basically you can identify the fibers of this bundle with the, with the fibers of this associated bundle. And so this is one of the rare occasions where we actually have a smooth bundle of Hilbert spaces in infinite dimensions, because this group LSOD acts actually smoothly on this, on this Hilbert space, um, which is sort of maybe curiosity because usually bundle of Hilbert spaces are not smooth, but in this case, um, this is really a smooth bundle of Hilbert spaces. Sorry, Matthias, I have a, a, a very quick question. Yes. So H0, what is it in general? It appeared earlier as a general notation, H0. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, so H, H0 was sort of um, my model Hilbert space for the fiber. And in this case, it's really just gonna be sort of from now on, it's gonna be this particular Hilbert space, except that in a moment, we'll, we'll change it a little bit because of an issue that will come up, which I'll tell you about. But basically, it's this L2 space of sections <coughs> or functions, which is the model space for, for the fibers of the loop space um, tangent bundle. Um, and so the point is now how to get how to get a polarization for this for this bundle, right? Because I said we really need this. 
And so here's a discussion sort of from, from first principles. Let's, let's look at this um, like slightly more general situation where we look at this Hilbert space H sub E where, where E is just some real vector bundle on, on the circle, okay? So in, in this case, where we looked at H naught, it's just a trivial one, or in this case, um, it's, it's this pullback of the tangent bundle along the loop. So um, let's look at it in this more general situation where E is sort of arbitrary <clears throat> and ask, um, so how, what is a sensible equivalence class um, of Lagrangians, which, which we would maybe denote by lag E. Um, so what's, what's a, how can we define an equivalence class of Lagrangians in a sort of a natural canonical way on the Hilbert space? Um, and so one thing we might ask for is that, I mean, this is a Hilbert space of sections of a bundle. So, so there's sort of a very um, <clears throat> distinguished class of operators, which are pseudo differential operators, right? Um, so which sort of mean that they're local in a certain sense. And I think there are other ways to say this, for example, um, I mean, if, if you want your, your class of Lagrangians to be sort of smooth or like, I mean, in, in varying under the rotation of loops, and then maybe you want the rotation action to, on, on, on the space of Lagrangians to be smooth and so on. Um, what then happens is that <clears throat> automatically the projections onto your Lagrangians should be um, pseudo differential operators. Um, and so, <clears throat> since um, so, so let's 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 say this for now that this is a very natural class of operators. And um, so, so what we require is that the orthogonal projection onto this onto, onto every Lagrangian should be a pseudo differential operator. Um, at least up to an era of a Hilbert Schmidt operator, because like we can always modify by Hilbert Schmidt operators in a certain way and then get a new Lagrangian. Um, but that's not a problem. And such operators, like pseudo differential operators with up to this era, um, they still have principal symbol. And um, all these projections must have the same principal symbol because if, if I modify something by Hilbert Schmidt operator, that won't change this principal symbol. That would be of lower order. And so this principal symbol is this homogeneous function of degree zero or well, homogeneous on the cotangent bundle of S1. Um, so really you could also say it's, it's, it's a function on the sphere bundle of S1, which is something very simple. It's just a union of two spheres. Um, and then also sort of we needed to be scalar to be geometrically sensible, right? Otherwise this would amount to like fixing a basis of E or whatever. So um, it's, so P of Xi for every Xi is an amorphism of, of E at, the, at that point. And so we need to be scalar. And then also it needs to be a project, projection symbol. And then it really needs to be of this form, right? There's only one scalar um, projection symbol, namely a non-trivial one. Or, well, two, because we can do plus and minus. And um, so it, it must be of this form uh, times the identity on, on, the, on the fibers. So that's, that's basically the only way, um, only possible symbol. And so then, then there's this funny lemma of, of coming in from, which uses the, the um, paper of Atiyah and Singa, so the fifth one where they look at skew adjoint operators. Um, and it says that um, basically the, the upshot is there exists a Lagrangian such that the projection onto it has this principal symbol if and only if the dimension of E plus the first schiefer whitney class of E are zero mod two. So, I mean, vector bundles on S1 only have two invariants, right? It's the dimension and the first Schieffer Whitney class. So are they twisted? So I'm talking about real vector bundles here, right? So are they are they twisted when you go around or not? And what's what's their fiber dimension? And you have this restriction on what's going on. And so if if now E should be the pullback tangent bundle, we have a certain problem because if your manifold is oriented, then their first Schieffer Whitney class will be zero because 
of naturality of W1. So oriented means that W1 of the tangent bundle is zero. And so it's dimension, if your manifold has odd dimension, then the dimension of E will be odd. So this, this condition is not satisfied. And so what, what is a natural thing to do, or I don't know, more, more or less natural anyways, I'll, I'll do it. So I'll, I'll look at this sort of modified situation where really we tensor with, with the Möbius bundle. And, and you can think about, I mean, here's the tensor product. So if, if this was an even bundle, this doesn't really do anything because tensoring a Möbius bundle with something even is just doesn't do anything. It's the same, like just this even bundle again. And uh, in odd dimensions, it, it really corrects to just satisfy this formula. So in even dimensions, you can forget about this in odd. It, it should be there in order to give you something. And then what we get is a smooth bundle of Hilbert of, po of polarized Hilbert spaces. Namely, for each gamma, we can look at the class of Lagrangians in H gamma such that the corresponding orthogonal projection is a um, modulo Hilbert-Schmidt operator, a pseudo differential operator with, with this given principal symbol. Okay, maybe I should say plus here, right? I have to choose one sign now. <clears throat> so, Matthias, so, so you're doing some sort of a twisting, right? Um, you're twisting by this Mobius bundle. Yeah. Although, maybe uh, you could please remind me, what's that? What did you mean by a Mobius bundle? Here? Oh, sorry, it's the, it's the one dimensional uh, bundle that like has not trivial W1. So the bundle, oh, that you, it's sort of, that, that is a Mobius strip when you go, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you okay. take a one dimensional vector bundle and glue it to itself with a non-trivial. Okay, uh, I thought that's, that's what you mean. So you're twisting by that in order to account for the, um, the lack of sections. And then when you twist, yeah, you get that. It's yeah, a yeah, process yeah. of twisting. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's sort of in order to, to satisfy this condition, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you don't have to do this for, for the spinner bundle itself, but later for the, for the fusion product, you really want Lagrangians to be there. Otherwise, I don't quite know how, how this would work. Um, so anyway. Um, I think you, like if this confuses you, don't, you shouldn't think about this too much and just pretend we're in the even dimensional case where this is completely superfluous. <laughs> so, um, no, actually, it's natural. I'm saying it's a process of twisting that occurs in other situations. It's a natural thing to do by tensoring with appropriate uh, bundles. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, another, another way to say this is it's, it's the spin, spinner bundle for the bounding spin structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, right. So if you think about like these loops being the boundary of the surface, then this is what you get maybe if you look at spin surfaces. Anyway, so I think there's a lot, lot, of, lot to say about this, which, which may be confusing. Yeah. That's probably more standard notation. That's what I meant um, than maybe a bundle, although I understood um, morally what you mean. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. Maybe I should have said it differently, yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, and then what you get is this bundle of super Clifford von Neumann algebras on the loop space, which is just this bundle of type one factors that exists. And you can say something about its characteristic classes. So, so there's this result that sort of slightly reformulated version of, of something that I proved in this, in this paper a while ago. Um, so, and it says that um, the spin C structure for this Hilbert space, sorry, spinner bundle for the Hilbert space. That's that's the terminology that I used. So a spinner bundle um, for for the Hilbert space. Um, so a Hilbert bundle. So with with specifically these fibers, right? Um, exists if and only if um, this ad admits a lift of the structure group to the basic central extension of L spin D. Okay, so uh, so this really is two steps again, going like corresponding to the fact that this is super bundle gerb. First, you need to, I mean, this group has two connected components because I one of S O D is Z mod two, and um, and so um, so you first need to be able to to reduce the identity component of this group. And then further lift to to um, to this loop group, and if you can do that, 
then um, so that's the same thing as being able to find um, like a spinner bundle for this Clifford. So, so basically a spinner bundle for this for this bundle H, which is which is a bundle of left modules for this super for Neumann algebra bundle, which like pointwise is a Morita equivalence to C. And and in, in this box here, it says this is related, not not equal to the strain condition. And the reason is that <clears throat> basically, um, so uh, this lift is possible if if the the transgression of one half p one of x is zero, and also the transgression of w two of x is zero. So basically the characteristic classes of this obstruction gerb in this situation are these two. They are the transgression of, of the first fractional upon triangle class. That's the Z values three class and the transgression of the second Schlieffer Whitney class. That's the Z two valued one class in the loop space. Um, and so you need these to vanish in order for loop space spinner bundle to exist. But the string condition is that like sort of these classes vanish themselves and not only their transgression, right? So of course, if you have a string manifold, then you'll always be able to define a loop space spinner bundle, but you'll also be able to define a loop space spinner bundle sometimes if under these weaker conditions. And so the question, and that's was sort of the motivating point of view for this preprint of Schultz and Teichner was like, how, how can we fix this? Right? How, um, how like what structure can we add to the spinner bundle so that this structure exists if and only if the manifold is string? And uh, yeah, the answer is um, the fusion product. And so um, that's that's what I'll explain next. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit so I have fifteen more minutes. Is that right? <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, so basically the upshot <clears throat> for now is that, um, that I mean, the spinner bundle on loop space is really something not very scary. It should be sort of a very natural thing to do and it generalizes all very nicely from finite dimensions. <clears throat> it's only that it has this drawback of not really corresponding to string manifolds, but it's being something slightly weaker and we need some additional structure on it to maybe make it geometrically really meaningful. Okay, maybe a short interlude, which is uh, a why, why do we consider von Neumann algebras in the first place? So, um, because one thing is that the algebraic Clifford algebra has a canonical completion to a C star algebra. So it has, it has a unique, C star norm, which is something pretty nice and sort of unusual for star algebras that they have just one uh, C star norm. And you could use that instead, but the automorphism group of this thing is contractible. So that's not, that's not really interesting. Whereas this, this von Neumann completion that, that I looked at, this bundle of at one factors, that has automorphism groups at two times PQH, because the automorphism group of, of uh, B of H is PQH. And the Z2 sort of corresponds to the fact that we have super factors and not only factors. And so, so this is another way to, to see where these two characteristic classes come from, by the way, right? So this is a KZ2 and this is a KZ20. And you shift one to get the classifying space and then Anyway, so the contract contractability of the automorphism group, the C star algebra tells you that like there were, if you, if you took the pointwise C star algebra completions of your Clifford algebra bundle, the algebraic one, then you get a trivial bundle. And this can never be the obstruction to anything like trivializing this. And also it's not Morita equivalent to C. <laughs> so really, that doesn't really make sense to look at spinner bundles or like left module bundles over, over, over this bundle, right? So you can look at the algebraic situation or on the von Neumann situation from this point of view, but 
Um, the algebraic situation is sort of too restrictive because like if you also look at the algebraic Fox spaces, which is the natural thing to do, then, then as representations, these are only equivalent if, if, if this difference of projections has finite rank, which is much too weak. Like so compared to the Siegel equivalence condition, this, this was Hilbert Schmidt, this is finite rank, which is not, not good to work with, right? Like on the loop space, this will never be satisfied. So this, this doesn't work. And there are many other reasons for phenomenal algebras to work on, <clears throat> to work with phenomenal algebras, and I think that's what's coming next. So that's the fusion product. So suppose that we're given a spinner bundle for, for this um, sort of H bundle over, over the loop space, right? That was this twisted bundle of two spaces. And by definition, each <clears throat> for each loop gamma, S gamma is a left module for this Clifford algebra, and also for this von Neumann algebra completion of this Clifford algebra. And um, so now what we do is we chop up our loop into, into pieces. <clears throat> and so Px2, so that's my notation for the, so Px, um, that's going to be the path space, so the space of paths characterized from zero to pi with values in x. And what I want is that all the derivatives of, of these paths vanish at the end points. And the reason is, if, if, I, if I require that, and if I glue together two paths, then I'll get a smooth loop as opposed to a loop with a kink if I didn't put this condition, right? Um, and so this, this twofold fiber product is meant over the end points. And so these are elements of this are just tuples of paths which, which share the same end points. And I can glue them together to a loop in the loop space. Okay, so here's the picture. So this is the glue loop and these are the individual loops that I glue together. And so correspondingly, so, so I have this Hilbert space H gamma one gamma two, that was this L2 space with of sections of this pulled back tangent bundle twisted with this Mubius bundle or bounding spinner bundle. And this has the, 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 the subspace of sections that vanish sort of in the second half of the circle. And of course, I mean, everything's trivial. So basically I can write it in this, in this way. I can choosing one, one and for all a trivialization of like this Mobius bundle over the zero pi. I can just do this once and for all. And then there's another thing. There's a non-trivial <clears throat> identification going on. Namely, so here minus, if I have a real Hilbert space, then minus this Hilbert space denotes the same Hilbert space with the um, opposite real structure. And so <clears throat> we can identify sort of the opposite of this Hilbert space for the other half of the loop with the orthogonal complement of this space V gamma two for the first half of the okay, second, first, there's a slip going on in my conventions anyway. Um, and this goes as follows. Namely, uh, well, I mean, this, I mean, okay, I said V gamma two is a subspace of H gamma one union gamma two. And so the same thing happens here, just, just ran, right? V gamma one is naturally a subspace of H gamma two union gamma one. Where, where here I, I, I flip the order in, in comparison with this thing. But now there's also this flip involution on the circle. Um, <clears throat> And then which, which maps H gamma two union gamma one to H gamma one union gamma two. Um, but then I also multiply by I, the complex unit, because what this does is it intertwines the real structure with this negative, right? So, so it sort of gives a map from minus this space to this space. That's sort of this thing that I do here, and why do I do this? Well, so this gives a decomposition of my Hilbert space into minus V gamma one, minus V gamma one plus V gamma two, and the correspondingly the Clifford algebra can be decomposed in this way. So first I use that like the Clifford algebra of a tensor product is the tensor product of the Clifford algebras, and then I use the Clifford algebra of the opposite real Hilbert space 
is the opposite of the Clifford algebra of the Hilbert space. And here, what I need to say is beware, this is the super tensor product, and this is the super opposite, where like things have a sign whenever, whenever dictated by the causal sign rule, and otherwise these isomorphisms don't exist. So, so you need to work in the super world here to make this work. Okay, so <clears throat> what does this mean? So the spinner bundle was a, was a bundle of left modules for this thing, and because I can decompose this thing, I can, I mean, a left module for an opposite algebra is the same thing as a right module for the algebra itself. So the spinner bundle becomes Clifford V gamma, V gamma one, Clifford V gamma, sorry, V gamma two, Clifford V gamma one by module, okay? And <clears throat> now we need to lift this to, to like a von Neumann algebra completion. And um, so how do we actually von Neumann algebra complete these path algebras? So we know that this has a canonical completion using this canonical equivalence class of Lagrangians to a von Neumann algebra. So what we can always do is, I mean, this v, v gamma two is a subspace of this space. So we can include this algebra into this algebra. And this is the subalgebra of this thing. So we can just take the completion of this inside here and get a phenomenon algebra. But of course, a priori, this depends on the choice of gamma one. And then there's this lemma, which says that it doesn't. So basically the topology, the weak topology in, induced by this phenomenon algebra on this al algebra by this inclusion um, does not depend on the choice of gamma one. And so, again, you get a canonical von Neumann algebra completion of this like path space Clifford algebra. It's not a loops like loop Clifford algebra, but a path space path Clifford algebra. And I always denote this by A gamma two. And this this von Neumann algebra comes with inclusions like this. And <clears throat> so this is how sort of. Um, what we, how we see that the spinner bundle has this left action by this canonical von Neumann algebra completion of this Clifford algebra. So it has a left A gamma two action that extends the action of the Clifford algebra of gamma two. But now uh, the, the right action is more tricky. There's this diagram, which, um, and, and here, the, 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 really, the, the crucial point is that, um, maybe I'll not explain this in detail, but the crucial point is that, like, this flip involution here um, places, like, does not only change, change the halves of the circles, but it also replaces the, the equivalence class of Lagrangians that we, like, the canonical one, with its opposite. It's basically the one in the very beginning, we chose a sign for this principal symbol, right? We said it's the principal symbol should be like the sign of Xi and would have also been minus the, the sign of Xi. And the Sigma just replaces these two, like flips these two choices. And now there's this very tricky lemma somehow that sort of made me a little baffled that this is a little tricky, but it says that, so, this phenomenon algebra here is the canonical completion of this, um, here I should say, of the Clifford algebra, like sort of of the, of the, of the Clifford algebra to the opposite Hilbert space with respect to the opposite equivalence class of Lagrangians. And algebraically, this Clifford algebra is isomorphic to the opposite Clifford algebra of H itself. So Clifford minus H is isomorphic to Clifford H op. And so, and so this isomorphism carries over to the von Neumann algebra setting. Uh, if on one side you take the completion with respect to the opposite equivalence class of Lagrangians, and on the other, you take completion with respect to the original one. And so, so if, then you can look here at this diagram and see that like really this, this, <clears throat> this this, this right action has an extension to this to this a gamma one of algebra or to, to a gamma one. So, and 
Uh, okay, so this is a little technical, but the, the upshot is that this spinner bundle is an A gamma two A gamma one bimodule. And now, uh, now here's the here's the definition. So a fusion product for the spinner bundle is is an isomorphism like this. So I, I came to like the letter upsilon for this isomorphism because <laughs> it looks a little bit like like fusing two things. You can also say it looks like pulling apart two things, but um, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and so, um, what, what what do these symbols mean? So, I mean, you can of course you can restrict the spinner bundle to to the twofold fiber product of the X with itself along this this gluing map, <clears throat> and then you can also take three different pullbacks, right? Two px three along the three different projections from px3 to px2. And so, and you can similarly, this, this bundle A is a bundle of von Neumann algebras over px itself. And so you have three different algebra bundles over px3 given by pulling back A along these three different uh, um, yeah, um, projections. And I would label them by A1, A2, and A3. And so this is an, a3, A2 bimodule bundle. This is an A2, A1 bimodule bundle. So it makes sense to take their tensor product over A2. And this is an A3, A1 bimodule bundle, just as this tensor product. And so a fusion product is an isomorphism of A3, A1 bimodule bundles, uh, which are all graded. So this should be a grading preserving isomorphism. And, uh, and so here, what I need to what I need to emphasize is that this tensor product here must be the confusion tensor product. So that's the tensor, like the appropriate tensor product for bimodules over von Neumann algebras. And um, if you try this in the in the algebraic world or in the C star world, this will not work because then this tensor product will not be isomorphic to the space. And but it does work in the von Neumann case. And um, so, so there's this, this theorem that says that these two bimodules are indeed isomorphic. Um, I can't really say much about the proof, but the, but the point is that, um, so um, if you choose a very nice Lagrangian or like additionally a cyclic and separating vector, then uh, it turns out that, um, that this Fox space is um, is sort of the non-commutative L two space for this algebra, sort of which is the identity for confusion, and but then one of the actions is twisted, and you decide that it that it's not twisted in a non-trivial way, and you do this by like it's really possible to ex explicitly calculate this modular conjugation in, in, a, in a specific setting, and see that it sort of coincides with this with this map sigma that we saw before that sort of defines the right action. So this, this right action that we defined above coincides with the right action for um, given by this um, Tomita Takazaki von Neumann algebra theory. Um, so the right action given by the modular conjugation for um, a specific Lagrangian and a specific choice of cyclic and separating vector. And that's sort of the crucial point here. And that's sort of a difficult, a really sort of difficult theorem to prove. Um, but then we're good, right? So if we know this theorem that they're really isomorphic, then, <clears throat> then well, th then really what we can do is we can just ask, does an isomorphism like this exist? Yes or no, and that's a topological thing. So, um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just finish with this lemma and this theorem, give me two more minutes. So first for a fusion product on the spinner bundle to exist, X must be necessarily be spin. I'm prepared to like show you the proof, but I don't have time now. Um, so I just will very briefly sketch the proof of the, of the crucial theorem, which says a fusion product exists if and only if X is a string manifold. And the proof idea is that, that this line bundle that we looked at sort of implicitly above, so, I mean, what we want is, what a fusion product is, is it's a section of this line bundle, 
right? It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's an isomorphism from this one to this one. So it's a section of this line bundle. By the way, so this is really a line bundle because this is isomorphic to this one and each of these are isomorphic to a Fox space, which are very useful representations. <clears throat> and so this is a line bundle over PX3. Then we fix one base point in our manifold to, to, to make this work. And then it's a cover of our manifold and over the threefold fiber product of this cover, we have a line bundle. And that's the structure of a bundle two gerb over X. And then what you can do is um, to prove two things, namely first that a trivialization of this two gerb just provides a fusion product, sort of the same thing. And on the other hand, um, you can write down an explicit isomorphism to um, a churn Simons two gerb, which is the obstruction gerb for, um, for um, yeah, for a, the lit for, for a string structure to exist. And so, so that's really, um, so that's how this proof goes that um, you can really see that this, this is an isomorphic, um, yeah, description of the situation. And uh, yeah, so what you then can do is you can define the string or two, two bundle, a string or two vector bundle um, that, that was sort of envisioned by Stolz and Teichner without having their, using this two vector bundle language, but that's sort of, an image that I can just leave you with. And uh, so thanks, thanks for the talk. Great. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Thank you very much for the nice talk, Matthias. Um, any further questions for Matthias? So nice, nice choice, by the way, with the epsilon, excellent choice of, uh, of notation. <laughs> Very descriptive. Know, Conrad agrees. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> right, Conrad. I see Conrad is here. So I might have asked this to Conrad. Now, uh, are we able to to uh, to take sections and then okay, if we can do that, are we able to throw in that Dirac operator and go in that direction? Um, so I guess. Well, what what do sections mean, right? So um, I think there's always a choice to make which is you can work on the loop space or we can try to work on the manifold in like a higher geometric setting. So then we'd have a two vector bundle and it's maybe not clear what sections of these things are. Whereas on the, on the higher level, you might have more analytic problems or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but of course, so um, I sort of boasted a little too much in saying that this is um, sort of the solution of, of the paper of Stolz and Teichner. This is how, how, how it goes, because it's only half. Because what's missing is the, the structure of the conformal connection, which they sort of envisioned. And this is not yet put in. So this is basically a differential topological constructions, construction, because like we, we can say what smoothness means, but we can't put or don't put on the geometry yet. So like connections and things. And of course you need that to define like a Dirac operator, things like that. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think the analysis is very much unclear, of course, in, in all this, all these settings. But um, I guess yeah. it's progress and, and, and I mean, we're working on the connections and we're, we have some ideas and it, it's it's going on, so <laughs> um, we'll see. So ask me again in like two years or whatever. Okay, good. That sounds promising. Excellent. <laughs> yes, that's great. Um, so then the idea is that we can go back and forth, of course, as um, as uh, the originators talk about these things, um, having a higher structure on the manifold itself. Or high, having a simple structure on the on the loop space, yeah. right? We can go back and forth thanks to the to the fusion structure, right? Exactly, right. That's that's sort of the, the whole point of this. Um, and also, I mean, it, it is clear that like some index theorem or whatever sh should only work if you have this fusion structure, right? Because, um, I mean, yeah, I mean there. Are, many results pointing in that direction that, that only then things really, really work and assemble. Um, so 
Yeah, and I, I don't really, yeah, I mean, that's, that's another complication, right? Like if, 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 you, if you look at these sections, what, are, what is an appropriate space of sections to look at that sort of takes into account the fusion product in, in, a, in a reasonable way? And of course, yeah, I appreciate it. It's highly non-trivial, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, but, uh, but you guys are, are doing uh, excellent work, so I, I hope that can be resolved as well, <laughs> given <laughs> how much um, you have achieved. Um, all together. Okay, great. Any other questions for Matthias? Okay, if not, let's thank him again for the very nice talk. Thank you, Matthias. All right. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you again for.